Good morning, everyone. Jamie here. Welcome back. I'm so glad you guys are here. Today is another video in my Gardening for Beginners series. And today we're going to talk all about pest management, which I have to be honest with you guys, I'm not super excited about this topic. <laughs> I don't like talking about pest management. I don't like dealing with pest management. I especially don't like researching pest management because then I have to look at all those pictures of the little bugs and it kind of just makes me sick to my stomach. So I don't love it, but it's something that's important. It's something that we need to know as gardeners. Um, it's something that we need to educate ourselves about so that we're handling it responsibly. Having said that, I think that the most responsible way to manage your pests in your garden is by using the, I guess you could say technique, it's called integrated pest management. And I wanna read you guys a little excerpt that I found to that, that I think perfectly describes integrated pest management really well. I wanna read it to you so that I don't mess it up by paraphrasing it. All right, so integrated pest management or IPM is a multi-pronged strategy that advocates beginning with the least toxic methods for pest control and gradually incorporating stronger control methods until the pests are acceptably managed. This is environmentally sound and responsible. So basically what it's saying is that you use all the techniques that you have and you always start off with the least toxic or the least harmful to the environment. I always think of this as, you know, healthy soil gives you healthy plants that are going to protect themselves against these pests and be able to handle this pest pressure. So even starting with something like healthy soil and, um, you know, uh, uh, fertilizing well and responsibly and really just taking care of your plants is actually a part of IPM because that's going to give you nice healthy plants that are going to be less susceptible to pest pressure. So there are different levels, like it said in that excerpt, there are different levels of pest control and from least toxic to most toxic, the least toxic we have physical or mechanical pest control, then a little bit more toxic or, you know, a little bit stronger, I would say, is biological pest control. And then the third one is chemical pest control. And we'll get to that. First, I want to talk about physical or mechanical pest control. So physical or mechanical pest control is exactly what it sounds like. You're not actually adding anything to the garden. You're just doing something to, to help manage the pests. So I kind of think of prepping your soil as this, you know, you're making sure that you have nice, healthy soil um, and a nice environment for that plant to grow healthy and be able to handle the pest pressure themselves. Other options or other ways to do physical or mechanical pest control are using stuff like row covers or cloches or things like that that are actually going to physically protect the plant from the pests. So this works really well for gardeners or flower gardeners or things, you know, people like that that are growing in nice long rows because you can actually put a physical barrier between the pests and the plants and protect those plants from the pests that might eat them. The drawback to this are gardeners like myself who garden for, you know, to have their garden look beautiful. My garden is not going to look as beautiful and what is the point of growing flowers if I'm just going to put a row cover over them so that I can't see them and nobody else can see them. So this way, this technique of mechanical or physical pest management doesn't really work for me. Um, you know, it, it's a really good idea and I understand it, but it's just, it doesn't work for me. The other drawback to using stuff like this is that it can also block out uh, beneficial pollinators, um, you know, like the bees and the butterflies and stuff like that. So you have to think of that when you do this type of pest control. Other options for mechanical or physical pest control include, you know, a strong stream of water from your hose. I've talked to many um, a gardener who has used this technique of turning their hose onto like the jet or the really strong stream and then just spraying off their plants and they use that for white flies. We get a lot of white flies around here especially in the summer and you know they're not horrible they don't they don't really bother my plants you know I don't see they never get so bad enough in my garden that I see negative effects from the white flies but they're annoying it's annoying to go through and you know swipe the plant and then all of a sudden you get this blossom of of white flies coming up your nose um so using a strong stream of water from your hose is another physical or mechanical pest control method that you can use that is completely non-toxic um the the last 
way that I wanted to talk to you guys about the physical or the mechanical pest control is actually, it's gross, actually physically picking the bugs off of the plant. And this is, this is technically pest control, right? So this works really well for Japanese beetles. It's one of the only things that works for Japanese beetles. And then I also use this technique for budworms. When I, there are times that I will go out into my garden and I will just be on the hunt for budworms and looking for them and I'll pick them off the petunias and I'll smash them <laughs> and it works. It works really well. It's a good way to get at them and it's completely non-toxic. So for IPM, starting with the least toxic method, you want to start with the physical or the mechanical pest control methods. So the next type of pest control method that I want to talk about, which is kind of the next level up from the physical or mechanical type is biological. And the two things that I think of when I think of biological pest control, I think of beneficials. Um, people, people say beneficials and I never knew what that meant, but it means beneficial insects. And so that's like ladybugs, lace wings, um, and praying mantis. Um, and that's one way. And then the other way is using something called BT. And I'll get to that in a second. So going back to the beneficials, these guys are so wonderful to have in your yard. They work so well. They help with the ecosystem. Um, what you can do is you can go to your local garden center and you can buy a bag of ladybugs and it comes, you know, in this little mesh bag and it has hundreds of ladybugs crawling around inside and then you release them into your garden and they go to town and the main thing that they eat, they love eating aphids. So if you're dealing with an aphid infestation, getting ladybugs into your garden is really, really helpful. Now the drawback of having ladybugs is that once they've eaten all the aphids in the area, they'll just fly away to find more food. So it's kind of an expensive way to deal with pest control because you keep having to buy more ladybugs unless they're not getting to all the aphids and then you just need to get more ladybugs and you know, on and on and on. Last year I used this method and it was night and day compared to the year before. So the year before was the first full year that I had in this garden. We moved in in January of 2020 and the pests that I had in this garden were insane. I had so many, it felt like it took up so much of my time to deal with the pest control in this garden and I knew I had to do something about it. So early in the spring of 2021, I went and I got two bags of ladybugs from my local garden center and I released them and Honestly, it was a noticeable difference. My gardening season was so much more pleasant because those ladybugs had taken care of the aphids and the, you know, the, the pests that they eat um, around my garden. And then it was so funny, I was growing foxgloves in my cut flower garden for the first time that year. And I kept seeing these weird little bugs on my foxgloves and I had no idea. And finally I asked my neighbor and I said, cause he's a gardener, he's a vegetable gardener. And I said, do you know what these bugs are? I don't know how to treat them or how to deal with them. And then he told me they were lady, like baby ladybugs, ladybug larva. So it was great because the ladybugs were so happy in my garden, they were reproducing. And I had tons of the little baby ladybugs all around. So I knew that I was gonna have more ladybugs throughout the season. Um, the one drawback that I was thinking about that is that meant that I still had the aphids, you know, as a food source for them. So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a give and take. You want to have lots of ladybugs in your garden, um, but having lots of ladybugs in your garden means that you do have aphids. Uh, but I never noticed it. It never really bothered me. It never got out of hand. And I think that having beneficials in your garden is huge. The other thing that I do have in my garden is I have a lot of praying mantis. And I think that that's just a regional thing. Um, you know, there are, so I don't know if you guys have praying mantis in your area, um, but there's a certain time of year when all the baby praying mantis hatch and there's these tiny little praying mantis, you know, just around everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And they're really, really good to have in your garden. It's a good thing. And they're so funny too, cause you know, they'll turn and they'll look at you. <laughs> I'll be digging in my garden and notice a praying mantis and then he'll turn and look at me and say, what are you doing? Don't bother me. I just think they're so funny. So anyway, uh, <laughs> beneficials are really fantastic. They are a really, I think, good organic pest control method, biological pest control method that's not going to mess with your ecosystem. So it's a really good option. So the other way for biological pest control is the use of something like BT. And BT, I'm not going to say it right. I'm going to write this. 
I'm gonna write the name down here, the long name down here, but it's actually a compound that's derived from soil. And um, what you do is you spray this on, I use it on my petunias, I need to use it on my petunias, and then the baby caterpillars, specifically the budworms, will eat this and then they'll die. And so BT is a natural, um, you know, pest control method that will kill the budworms on the the plants that you don't want them to eat and i need i need to use this you know i can't go through and i can't just mechanically physically pick off all the budworms because i can't just keep up with them i have way too many in my garden so i do use bt on a weekly basis especially during the summer um, and i use it responsibly you know i spray it really close to the plants i don't spray it on a windy day i am planning to plant more pollinator friendly plants in my garden this year with the hope of attracting more butterflies specifically monarchs so i am going to have to be careful and make sure that i plant those pollinator friendly plants very far away from the petunias that i have so that when i do spray something like bt if there is any cocoons or caterpillars or anything like that for beneficials they stay far away from it Okay, so the third type of pest control I wanna talk about, and this is obviously going up the level of the, the amount of toxicity for the environment and the IPM method, um, but the third type is chemical pest control, also known as insecticides. Um, and so there's a couple of them that I think are completely appropriate to use and safe to use, and those include neem oil and insecticidal soaps. And um, those two, I think you can be pretty confident in using. Neem oil is derived from a neem tree. I think that's what it is. And so again, it's a natural compound um, and it actually targets about 200 different pests. So it's a really good natural organic way to deal with pest pressure in your garden. Um, they, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised. I can't say that I'm surprised. There has been a lot of pushback on neem oil lately with the use in the garden. And as much as I can tell, and correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, um, but the, the pushback on neem oil is mostly because it can affect beneficials, right? Other pollinators that, that need to come. But however, I think, you know, if we are too strict on certain things, then some people, beginner gardeners, are gonna give up and then just go to the strong stuff and not bother with thinking about the environment or anything like that. So I think it's good to encourage people to use something natural like neem oil for pest control. You know, it's not gonna work as fast as a super strong insect insecticide, you know, that you can get at Home Depot or something like that, um, but it's gonna it's gonna be something that's really that's healthy for the environment and it's not gonna mess with your ecosystem too much. So I like to use neem oil when the biological or the physical or mechanical methods don't work in my garden and I'm still dealing with something, you know, like um, uh, aphids that I cannot get rid of with the ladybugs or something like that. So again, you want to be careful with neem oil. You want to be careful where you spray it. You don't want to just spray it willy nilly all around your garden um, because that's not going to help the ecosystem. But I do think it's a really good thing. You guys should look into it if you're not familiar with neem oil. You can also use neem oil for your houseplants. If you get any pests on your houseplants, which is going to happen, right? At some point, neem oil is a really, really good option for houseplants. All right, so the other type of chemical pest control that I really like is insecticidal soap. Um, so insecticidal soap, there's actually a lot of DIY recipes for this, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but basically how I think of it is you spray it on the plant and then the plant becomes so slippery because of the, the soap compound that the, the bugs just slip off. They can't eat it, they can't stay on it, they can't grab onto it, and they just slip off and fall off and then eventually die because they don't have the food to eat or the habitat that they need on your host plant. Um, so I think insecticidal soap is another one. I think it works really, really well. Monty Don recommends insect insecticidal soap a lot as well. The one, the thing that you have to worry about with insecticidal soap, other than you know spraying it willy nilly, is that if you spray it in the morning or in the middle of the day when the sun is going to be up for most of the day, um, the insecticidal soap can actually magnify the effects of the sun and then it can actually burn the leaves on your plants. So you have to think, just like all of these methods, you have to think about the time that you're gonna apply this, these pest control methods and insecticidal soap, you definitely wanna apply, apply in the evening 
or a completely cloudy day where the sun's not going to be out and not going to be burning your plants. So there are hundreds and hundreds of pests that you could deal with in your garden. And if you're watching this video to try and see if you can identify one of them, I don't think this video is going to help you. I think the, the best way to do it is to take a picture or get even a sample or even a leaf of um, you know, what the pest is, is eating or bothering and take it to your local garden center and they should be able to identify it for you very quickly. Um, another way that I think is really good, I will link it down below. It is the University of California IPM plant problem diagnostic tool. So basically what you do is you go to this website and you put in the name of the plant, you put in where the plant's being affected, um, you put in it, what's happening and and uh you know a couple other details and it will pop up and it will tell you what most likely is bothering your plants and it's not just for pests it's for you know funguses and um uh, viruses, you know, and different things like that. It is a really helpful tool and I use it often to try and identify pests that I don't, I don't readily recognize in my garden. Um, I should have done that for the, the ladybug babies, but my neighbor was right there. So it was easy to ask him. <laughs> so I will link that link down below. Again, it's called the University of California IPM plant problem diagnostic tool, kind of a mouthful, but it's really, really helpful and you guys should check it out. So last thing I wanted to go over is I just wanted to talk about a couple common pests, at least that I deal with. I'm in Northern California zone 9B, and these are a lot of the common pests that we see and kind of how I deal with them. So first off, uh, the first one I wanted to talk about was aphids. And you see aphids a lot of times on roses. I see it on my salvias sometimes. I, really, I'll see it on anything. I'll see it on my ivy that I've espaliated in the front. And the best way that I found to deal with aphids is like I said using beneficials or using the organic pest control method and I think that those work really well if you can catch it beforehand um, before it before it gets out of hand um, you know you're gonna see a sharp decrease in the amount of aphids that you're dealing with so beneficials are a really way, really great way to do it and then the the strong spray from your hose are is another really great way to deal with aphids so the other one that I deal with, and this is this is my arch nemesis, the one that I hate the most, <laughs> and that is budworms. And budworms are these little green worms. They come from cabbage moss. Um, uh, a lot of people call them di different names. My uncle was asking me what budworms were, and he said, oh, you mean cabbage moss. Um, so I'll list a couple of the names right here that other people call them. I call them budworms. Um, but basically, they're little green worms that come from the white butterflies that fly around. They lay their eggs on, you know, your broccoli, your cabbages, your petunias, um, your super bells, you know, a lot of different things. And these budworms will decimate a plant in a matter of hours days, hours, really. I had, when I first planted in my first, in my front annual border, I planted a plant of super tunias, and this was before I knew about budworms, and it just kept going, every day, it just kept going away, and it got shorter and shorter and shorter, and it ended up with just short little stems, because these budworms just ate the whole thing. Um, so I had, finally I figured out what it was, I had to learn how to deal with it, um, and that was BT, right, and, and then I just have to stay on top of it. If I don't stay on top of it, these budworms will get out of hand, and, and there will be no point for me to plant petunias in my yard, which is not okay with me. So um, like I said, spraying BT, I get the concentrated formula and then I dilute it in one of those garden sprayers, those pump garden sprayers. And then I go around once a week and I spray all my plants that are susceptible to budworms. Um, I have a video on budworms when I found some budworms on my petunias in my greenhouse. I'll link it up above so you guys can kind of see a closer look of budworms in action. Um, again, it's kind of gross, but you know, it's good to know. Um, and probably the, the first sign that you have budworms is budworm poop. So <laughs> it's gross, but it's true. That's the first sign. And as soon as you know what to look for, you know you got budworms and you got to deal with it. All right, so the third most common pest that I notice in my yard are slugs and snails. And we really only have these in the cooler months like December, January, February, sometimes March, and then it gets so hot they, they can't survive and they have to go into hiding and everything like that. Um, but when they're here, they do a lot of damage. Um, same with earwigs, that's another one, or pincher bugs, that's another one that we deal with a lot, but I kind of lump them into the slugs, snails, 
component. Um, so these guys, you know, you'll see their little tracks around on your sidewalks and stuff like that. And then they'll just kind of start chewing on your plants and you'll see little chew marks all over your green plants and they can do a ton of damage as well. And so the thing that I like the most, the pest control I like the most um, for slugs and snails is Sluggo Plus. And Sluggo Plus comes in little pellets. It's kid safe and pet safe and you just sprinkle it around and the slugs or snails crawl over it and then they die. I think it like dehydrates them or something like that. Um, but it works really, really well. As soon as I do that and if I stay on top of it, it takes care of the slugs and snails, no problem. The drawback to using Sluggo is that you have those, you know, those little pellets all over your yard, which I don't like, you know, it doesn't look as clean and it's not as nice. Um, you know, but it's a, it's a trade-off of what, of, you know, do you want your plants eaten or do you want those little white pellets around your yard? The other technique for getting rid of slugs and snails, which I've actually never tried, is you take a shallow saucer and you fill it with beer and you leave it out. And I guess, I guess the snails are attracted to the beer and they'll climb up and over it and then they'll drown in the beer. And then you empty it out and then you put it out another saucer of beer. So I've never tried that. It's, it sounds funny to me. Um, obviously I would call that a mechanical or physical way. I don't maybe it's a chemical because beer, <laughs> I don't know. But, um, but that's another way that you can get rid of slugs and snails. Okay, so I hope this video was helpful for you guys. I know it's not a very fun subject talking about pest pressure, but it's something that's important. It's something that we need to know about and something that we need to know how to deal with. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the subscribe button and I will see you in another video very soon.